Well, man, it's great to be with you guys today. It's the first time I've been up here on a baptism Sunday, so usually I'm in the back getting all emotional, to, uh, and uh, you don't see that, and so I had to kind of keep myself from getting emotional here up front. Uh, but man, it's a great day to be here. Um, I, I love story. I don't know about you guys, but I love a good story, and today we're getting to see a big part uh, of three stories that are a part of our church. Uh, three people have decided, hopefully more, uh, to, to give their life to Jesus and exactly, you know, fall into what that, what that means. They've decided to do that today. Last week, we also got the opportunity to learn a couple of stories from folks in our church, and I absolutely loved being a part of getting to see uh, what was happening through those videos, to see those stories unfold. But the importance of story is not just something that we have exclusive rights to, right? It's not just happening with us. In fact, it happens with each of us. I just don't hold on to my story, right? My story can impact somebody else's story. And the only thing that I'm an expert on is my story. So today we're going to jump into somebody else in Scripture uh, that is is a great story. And it's actually true. It actually happened. It's actually a massively important story in the life uh, of what we now call the church. But this week, I had the opportunity to sit down with business leaders in our community. Uh, and we sat in a circle, um, and, and we, we were at a retreat center. It was pretty awesome. We sat in this circle, and everybody got to share something that was significant to their story. People that I'd only known for a couple weeks opening up to people that they didn't know. It was great. I was the only pastor in the room, and I felt like I had to like stop and pray for everybody after they shared their story, but it would have lasted much longer, and I'm still the new guy, and I don't want to you know, look weird um, to, to some degree. But I've been with students, uh, with elementary school students at ice cream truck events, and you just listen to their story. And you see the people that are a part of their story. You see the grandmothers that bring them up to the ice cream truck to get a book and a popsicle. I've seen story, I've been a part of story, and I know that this story that we're going to uncover over the next couple weeks through the life of David is going to greatly impact the story that God is writing on each of your hearts. So whether you believe in God or not, whether you believe in God or not, he is weaving your story, he is weaving your story to bring him glory. And whether you believe, and this is crazy, whether you believe in him or not, God is still God. And I've gotten into plenty of arguments with college students about this over the years, but whether you believe it or not, it doesn't change who God is. Whether you believe in him or not, it doesn't change who he is. He is weaving, he is weaving your story to bring him glory. And so this is what we're going to see in the life of David. David was many things throughout the Old Testament. He was a very important figure. Most of us have probably heard of David. Even if you didn't grow up in the church, he's one of those transcendent figures of the Bible that just jumps off the pages. Even if you've never been to church, you've probably heard of some parts of what David's story uh, is about. Over the next few weeks, we're going to look deep into it. David's one of the most well-known, the most well-beloved, uh, and the, the biggest giants in Scripture. As we take a look today at a small section of David's story, I want to challenge you to spend some time really digging in to how you think it may connect with where you are right now. And as I studied this over the course of the week, I, I didn't really know um, how it connected with me. But as I read, as I read carefully, as I, as I grappled with this scripture that we're going to share today, I found a few ways that I think that it connects with everybody that's here today. And I don't want you to just agree with me, though. I want you to take those things and write them down and study them over the course of the week, challenge it to see if it's true in your life. We got to get some background though first. It's really hard to wrap up David's story in a, a three week deal, but we're going to try. Okay, so this is where we're at at the moment. The story of David stretches through several books of the Old Testament. 
1 Samuel is where we're going to live today, but, but David's story carries into 2 Samuel. It's in 1 King, parts of 1 Chronicles. David wrote most of the Psalms that we have in our scripture. Uh, so David's influence is all throughout the Bible. And actually, David, you can look into the beginnings of the New Testament and see that David is a part of the line and lineage of Jesus. So it goes even deeper than just David in the Old Testament. It traces all the way through to Jesus, and Jesus is who we're here celebrating today. David had a very big impact in why we do what we do. And we're just past the point in Israel's history where, where the people essentially begin to beg for a king. Uh, they, they're not like all these other kingdoms. They're not like all these other nations. They're not like all these other groups. They don't have a king, and so they start begging their prophets for a king. Okay, And then they get King Saul, which we'll talk about here in a bit, and then uh, through a transition that takes place, they get David. And, and then they, they want, though, somebody that is the stature of a king, a political king, a savior, somebody that's big, Caesar. Think Caesar. That's what they want. But that's not what they get. In 1 Samuel 3, we see the calling of Samuel, which is very, very important. So if you have some time this week, go back and look at 1 Samuel 3 to figure out who Samuel is, why Samuel's important, and then you'll understand a little bit more of what we've talked about today, because Samuel's incredibly important. So now we fast forward a bit, and we see um, in, the middle part, uh, in the middle part of 1 Samuel, we see Saul uh, and all the rage and anger and all the issues that Saul begins to have. If you, if you jump a chapter ahead of where we're going to stay today, in 1 Samuel 15, you can look at that story uh, of how Saul um, and Samuel, um, that, that issue of how, how it all goes down and how God tells Samuel that he has rejected Saul as a king. So there's a lot that's there. <laughs> So we're going to jump in at this point now. So we've got all this tension going on. And Samuel has to make a big decision. He has to talk to Saul. He tells, tells Saul that he's been rejected by God. And Sam, uh, Samuel's a little bit scared at this point. Okay? And this is where we pick up in 1 Samuel 16. Uh, verse 1 will be on the screen. The Lord said to Samuel, How long will you mourn for Saul, since I have rejected him as king over Israel? Fill your horn with oil and be on your way. I am sending you to Jesse of Bethlehem. I have chosen one of his sons to be king. Verse 2 says, But Samuel said, How can I go? If Saul hears about it, he will kill me. Did you hear that? So this is a tense situation. We're at the beginning of this story, and God's prophet Samuel is fearful. We see this a lot of times with God's prophets in the Old Testament. We see it a lot with them because they have to go make very big, important decisions, and Samuel's at this juncture. Uh, he says, how can I go? If Saul hears about it, he will kill me. He was afraid. The interesting thing to think about here is that Samuel is talking audibly with God, telling him that he's afraid. And I don't know if you've ever had that experience before. I've never actually spoken audibly with God. But this is a man who is God's chosen instrument as a prophet to his people in Israel. And he's talking to God audibly saying, hey, man, I, I can't do this. I can't do this. You know that guy's crazy. He's going to kill me. I can't do this. I'm scared. I can't do it. Even with God... Even with God on his side, even with God on his side, Samuel is afraid of Saul. Even with God on his side, Samuel is afraid of Saul. This is a pretty big juncture in this story. This is a pretty big moment here. Samuel is afraid. He, he's not just afraid like scared Halloween afraid like your kids get scared or whatever, they see, hear a ghost story. This is legitimate. He's fearful for his life. He's fearful for his life. I don't know if you've ever been in that spot where you've been afraid that where you're at or a situation that you might be into could turn south. He's afraid of what might happen to him. I don't know if you've been there 
I, I can't say that I've ever been in that spot that I'm legitimately scared to death. But this is where Samuel, the prophet of God, the man that is talking audibly to God, having a conversation with God, this is exactly where he's at. Why do we fear people and potential evil that the people can do to us when they're on God's side? When we're on God's side, why do we fear people? That's tough. I don't know the answer to that question. It's just a, it's a coping mechanism we have, I guess. I don't know. We're, we're afraid. Uh, we get scared easily. Maybe we don't fully trust who God is and what God's saying to us. But if you go back and look at the story of Samuel, I wish we had time to do it, but it's event after event after event after event where God shows up in a big way and then he tells Samuel to go and take care of a situation, to anoint somebody different, to, to make somebody else king, and Samuel says, I don't know, man, I can't do it. Can't do it. Can't do it. Why do we fear people when the potential evil that they can do to us uh, when God is on our side. If you look down at the end of verse 2, uh, the beginning of verse 3, we have another exciting or, or issue, potential issue here. He says this, The Lord said, this is, this is God speaking to, to Samuel, Take a heifer with you and say, I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. Invite Jesse to the sacrifice, and I will show you what to do. You are to anoint for me the one I indicate. So what's going on here is that God is talking to Samuel. He's saying, hey, I want you to take a cow to Jesse because uh, Jesse is the dad of the house that I'm going to pick the next king and I want you to take this and use it as a sacrifice, invite Jesse to join you and, and then just follow my lead. Anoint the person that I indicate. Bless the person that I choose, set up for me, set aside for me, make that person holy for me, the person that I tell you to anoint. Follow instructions, Samuel. That's what he's saying. Follow the instructions. Don't get so afraid. Fill up your horn with oil and follow my instructions. Have you ever been in that spot before? where you're giving clear instructions, but you're still scared of what might happen even if you follow through with those instructions? That's where Samuel's at. That's where he's at. He's like, I don't know. I don't know what this guy's talking to me about anymore. This guy's this old king. If I take him out, he's gonna, it's gonna be bad. He's gonna follow me. I gotta reject him. This is awful. I'm gonna die. He gives me a horn with oil and tells me to go take a cow with me you know, down the street to a family that I've probably never seen before. That's the situation that we're in. So to paraphrase verses four through six of chapter 16, this is what happens. Samuel did exactly what the Lord said. When he arrived at Bethlehem, the elders of the town trembled when they met him because they knew who he was. They asked if he came in peace, and Samuel said, yes, I come in peace. They, they came to give a sacrifice to the Lord. Uh, they, they did all that with, the, with everything that, that God said with the cow. And then as at the end, it says, um, then he consecrated Jesse and his sons and invited them to the sacrifice. So he made them clean and allowed them to be able to come to the sacrifice. When they arrived in verse six, Samuel saw Eliab and thought, surely the Lord's anointed stands here before the Lord. And that was one of Jesse's sons. But the interesting part here is that Samuel has fallen into the thought process of the rest of Israel. Samuel wanted the king to be something big and important and wanted him to look good and right, be, the, be the oldest. He wanted it to follow a simple, traditional line so that he had to do no more digging, no more extra work. He wanted it to be the political king and the political type of person, the fancy type of person that, that the other folks in Israel wanted before Saul was put in place. That's not what happens, because it, it, we're not doing a series on Eliab, right? That's not what happens. It's not an easy name to say either. So verse 7, 
Verse 7. It says, but the Lord said to Samuel, do not consider his appearance or height, for I have rejected him. The Lord does not look at the things that people look at. People look at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. How many of you have heard that phrase or statement before? Well, this is the context that it's in. It's in a very important context. Because it's a back and forth, it's a continual back and forth between, between God and Samuel. This continual back and forth, he's like, hey man, remember, remember, don't look at what everybody else looks for. That's not what I'm after. Don't look for what everybody else can do or say or w- what everybody else wants. I want something different. And that phrase that's packed in there, it says, the Lord does not look at the things that people look at. We could sit on that for three weeks, four weeks. Can you train yourself to be people that don't look at the things that people, other people look at and focus on the things that God looks at? There are so many things listed in scripture that God looks at. There's a passage in Philippians chapter four that talks all about that, verse eight. It tells us to dwell on things that are beautiful, that are worthy, right? Right? All of those things that we're supposed to dwell on, this is, this is that reminder for Samuel. It's like that tap on the shoulder. Hey, man, don't look at that guy. It's not him, and it's, it's not him, 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 and him. It's this guy over here that you're not looking at that I want you to pay attention to. The Lord does not look at the things that people look at. That should be pretty convicting. And like Clint said at the beginning of our gathering, if we're to lead to Jesus and we want to be like Jesus, then we have to look at things like Jesus. And this is just kind of a sub point of the message. That's pretty tough. Looking at people the way that the Lord looks at people. That's hard. It's probably easy to do in here because we love each other and we're gathered for the same reason. But when you go to work tomorrow, when you look at that guy or that girl that makes the first mistake in the cubicle next to you that affects you, how are you going to respond? How are you going to look at them? Are you going to look at them as God looks at them, or are you going to look at them as society looks at them? How are we going to do? How are we going to do that? The Lord does not look at the things that people look at. You know, this is the exact opposite of how the people of the day operated. In fact, this is the opposite of how we would operate today. In fact, there's a lot of times that we select people or we vote people into positions or we, we buy people's records or we watch their TV shows. Often it's because of what they look like on the outside, not who they really are on the inside. Often the one who God desires to use is very different from who society would choose. Very different. Often the one who God desires to use is very different from who, from who society would choose to use. Think about that. We see that all throughout the pages of Scripture. The guys that became known as the disciples were dropouts from their education program. They were dropouts. Nobody wanted to use them, but God chose them to start the church. And that's just one example. Often the one who God desires to use is very different from whom society would choose. And I love watching this play out. I love watching it play out over the pages of Scripture. And this is one of the many consistent themes that if we look from Genesis to Revelation that we could pull through the entire Bible. That God desires to use people, not only people that society wouldn't pick, because he picks some of those, those folks as well, but he uses everybody. He desires to choose everybody. Let's go back to verse eight. Then Jesse called Abinadab and had him pass by in front of Samuel. Another really cool name. If any of you are pregnant looking for a baby name, Abinadab is uh, is probably up there. Um, And had him pass in front of Samuel. Uh, But Samuel said, the Lord has not chosen this one either. Jesse then had Shema pass by, but Samuel said, nor has the Lord chosen this one. Verse 10, Jesse had seven of his sons pass before Samuel, but Samuel said to him, the Lord has not chosen any of these. So he asked Jesse, Samuel asked Jesse, are these all the sons that you have? And Jesse 
comes clean, and he says, hey, there's, there's one more. There's one more. Jesse answered, he's tending to the sheep. Samuel said, well, send for him. I'm not going to da- sit down until he gets here. Now, I don't know how far, away, how far away he was. Like, I don't know how big of a commitment this is for Samuel to stand there. I don't know if he's right down the street or in the backyard or several miles away. But Samuel knows that this is the guy, that this is the one. It's the youngest one. See, Jesse's fallen into the same trap that Samuel was falling into. He didn't want it to be David. In fact, he took all of the other ones that were more important, that looked better, that might have been whatever, and he took them and brought them to Samuel and left David to do the chores uh, in, the, in the pasture. But it, wasn't, it didn't go as Jesse planned either. God saw through Samuel's issue, and he saw through Jesse's issue too. He said, do you have any more? Do you have any more sons? Because none of these seven are it. Often the one that God desires to use is the forgotten person. Often, that's how it, how it takes place. We see it throughout the pages of Scripture. I didn't say always, I said often. Sometimes and often, you know, right there next to each other, they happen quite a bit. So we see this as another theme that we can trace throughout David's story. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about that next week, but we can trace this theme all the way through that David was not the first pick. If it was a school kickball game, David's not getting picked probably until the end because he's the little brother hanging out with all the older brothers. And this is David, this is the situation we're in. We see Jesse here almost hiding David because he either didn't want David to be it or he thought David had no shot. In studying this week, I came across this, and I I don't know that it's 100% true in every situation But it's definitely challenging in this context. I want to read it. It says, it's remarkable, isn't it, how Jesse reveals two very common mistakes that parents make. Number one, he didn't have an equal appreciation for all of his children. And number two, he failed to cultivate a mutual self-respect among them. Jesse saw his youngest as nothing more than the one who tended the sheep. Jesse sent, sent for David, and the rest is history. That's why we're not talking about Abinadab or Eliab. We're talking about David. Because David responded in obedience and came to his father's call, and he passed by Samuel. And Samuel says this. Or so he sent for him, and he had him brought in. He was glowing with health, and he had a fine appearance and handsome features. Then the Lord said to Samuel, rise and anoint him, for this is the guy. This is the one. To this point, David had still not been mentioned by name in this passage. So we are 12 verses in, and David, his name, had not been mentioned yet. But we get Abinadab and Eliab and Shema and all these other crazy names, and then David, not until the very last part of the passage is his name mentioned. God speaks to Samuel telling him to anoint David. That David was to be God's chosen one to lead Israel for the next portion of Israel's life as a kingdom. Let's look at verse 13. So Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the presence of his brothers. In the presence of his brothers. Now, I don't know exactly what happened here, but can you imagine the little brother walking past all of his bigger brothers to the line where he's getting anointed out of some horn that he's probably never seen and with some oil he's probably never touched, that he's being signified as the one that's chosen and he's walking past all of his older brothers. I can imagine that to be a pretty interesting scene. Um, I don't know, maybe it's just funny to me. He says this, and from that day on, the spirit of the Lord came powerfully upon David. Then Samuel went to Ramah. I want to look at that part, though, at the end. The spirit of the Lord came powerfully upon David. As soon as Samuel anointed his head with oil, 
which was a traditional thing to do in those days. We don't have a ton of time to get into the technical piece of it. But as soon as he was anointed, as soon as he was set apart, as soon as he was made, um, made holy through this process, David, the David that we know, was born to some degree. It was a new start. It was a fresh start for him. The Spirit of the Lord rested upon David. The Spirit of the Lord, and what we see here in the Old Testament, is when the presence of the Lord comes on a person for a specific set period of time and for a specific purpose. This is different from the Holy Spirit that we see in the New Testament because what we've talked about today is as a person comes to belief in Christ and is baptized, they do receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. This is a different thing. The Spirit of the Lord here is something different. It's powerful. It's, it's something for a set period of time for a specific purpose that we see in the Old Testament. This is not only something that David experienced. A lot of people experienced it in the Old Testament, but we all today have the opportunity through the Holy Spirit, who's more powerful, that can live in and indwell in us all the time, all the time. Hunter and Madison are already experiencing that today. It's incredible. Regardless that this, of this beginning of the story for David, who eventually become king, an important decision to make here is that even though David was chosen to be king, it did not mean that his brothers didn't have value. Okay? It did not mean that his brothers didn't have value. They just weren't chosen for this specific role. There's a lot that goes on here in this passage, but there's a few things that I think that this means for us as we wrap up. God choosing David, God choosing David was not something that David was looking for, right? David was in the pasture with the sheep. He may have heard about some guys that were coming, uh, but he didn't really know what it was about. He wasn't looking for it. He wasn't jockeying for position. He wasn't hustling up to try to be the guy that went through Samuel's line first. He didn't know it was happening. He didn't know what was going on. God was choosing David, and it wasn't something that David was looking for. God was choosing him, and it wasn't something that he was looking for. So could it be that God is choosing you here today to do something that you're not looking for as well? Could that be a possibility? Could God be calling you to something different or new or exciting or challenging, but you're not looking for it? Could that be the case? I think it might be. The interesting thing that I've relearned this week is that God is not bound by any cultural norms or standards or boxes that we try to put him in. God can take a shepherd boy in a field and anoint him to be king over all of his brothers, no matter what culture says. So what are you looking for? What are you paying attention to? Because you have no idea what God desires to do through you. You have no idea what he desires to do through you. You don't have a clue until you lean into it. You don't have a clue until you open your eyes. You don't have a clue until you listen. You don't have a clue until you step into it. I had no idea when I was a kid what God wanted me to do. I had no idea last year that God, when God was telling me to be a part of this, I had no idea what I was going to do. I just stepped off and trusted that God was going to take care of me and my family and give me something that I needed to do. There's two major points that I think we can apply today. The first one is this. God can do whatever he wants, whenever he wants. That's crazy. God can do whatever he wants, whenever he wants, and you could add to whoever he wants. God took Samuel, his prophet, to a field to anoint a shepherd boy in a pasture in Bethlehem. And this shepherd became king, and this king changed lives, and through the line of this king came our Savior. What would have happened if David wouldn't have gone to be anointed? What would have happened then? And the second thing is that God wants each of us. God wants each of us. 
So God doesn't just call David and then leave everybody else out. God doesn't just call one person or gift one person and leave everybody else out. That's not what this is about. He needed David for a specific task. And that task was to be king. It was the flashy task, but it was a very hard task. God chose David for a specific role. And God is choosing you for the very same thing. He's choosing you for a specific role. You know, how do I know that? You might be asking that. How do I know that? There's a scripture in Colossians that I'm going to close with that I think is absolutely critical for us to understand this today. The book of Colossians is an incredible book. It's written by a guy named Paul that we've talked about quite a bit. Um, and, and, the, and towards the tail end of this letter that Paul writes, he says these words, and he's talking to a church. He's talking to a church here. He says this in verse 12 of chapter three. Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved. I'm gonna stop right there. Therefore, as God's chosen people, people. David was chosen to be king. We as God's church are chosen to build families that are healthy, chosen to build communities that are strong. We are chosen for our role, our specific role in the body of Christ. Everybody is chosen. Everybody's chosen. I'll keep going. It says this, Holy and dearly loved, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Clothe yourselves with those things. So as you're chosen, start putting on those things. That's what happened in the life of David. He clothed himself with compassion and with humility and all of these other patience, all of these other things that became important for him in his, as his journey started. I don't know about you guys today, but as we wrap here, I just want to throw it out there. Are you listening to God? Because God's calling you. God's calling. You may be in the pasture and you may not be, that that, be sure that that call is from God. You may not know that that call is coming. But God is calling. And God's chosen you already. He desires a life for you that is beyond anything that you can imagine. Now, Jesus said it wouldn't be easy, but it will be what God desires 